God save us all. These were the only words spoken by General Michael Kenmore as the president gave the last number of the nuclear launch codes over the black telephone located in the command center. Michael knew that, while it may be warranted and necessary, this marked the end of life as he knew it. Yes, life would continue, but nothing would ever be the same. The walk to the small red button underneath a glass case was the longest walk he had ever made. The hundred foot walk felt like it was a hundred miles, each step more of a burden than the last. The whole world's fate rested on his fingertips, and there wasn't a damn thing he could do about it. Sure, he could refuse to click that red button under the dusty glass case, but they get someone else to do it anyway. If there was one thing Michael had learned in his life, it was that free will is something aspired to, but never actually gained. Theoretically, he could do whatever he wanted, but there is always someone influencing the decision and working their metaphorical fingers in your brain, twisting and morphing your thoughts into thinking they're your own when they truly are set there by someone else. And when you do have your own thoughts, the someone who's always more powerful decides that you need to think another way. And you do. You always do. He didn't want to press the button. He didn't want to watch the news the next day to see that the bomb he sent off wiped out a whole society ending the lives of every good, bad, and insignificant person there. But years in the army turned Michael, a once compassionate, thoughtful person, into a cold, bitter veteran who obeyed orders and didn't care enough about his own life, let alone someone else's. But this, this was different. He couldn't put his finger on it, having called in many missile strikes and many bombing runs. This was no inordinate object, but something was tugging on his subconscious this time, and he couldn't realize what. This made the walk even more unbearable, knowing that a part of him was trying to redeem himself, but all the other parts suppressing the feeling. And so, he finally reached the button. As he looked down on the dusty glass case, all he could see was his reflection. A reflection of a once celebrated hero, but now blurred by the old dust and fingerprints that have been collecting for years. His unshaven facial hair and the sunken look in his eyes were visible in the smudged reflection, but everything else was covered. The only other thing he could make out was a small frown growing bigger the longer he stared. He put his hand on the case, palm covering the button, and for a second, a mere moment, in the length of his life, he remembered Garrett. Garrett Kenmore, Michael's younger brother. He was a ray of sunshine, in a windowless room, a light at the end of the tunnel, a hope in a hopeless world. He was always Michael's favorite person, someone who he aspired to be like. For Garrett was kinder than all, more caring than all, and more understanding. He always thought the best of everyone and brought out of the good of everyone he met. But Garrett died during spring break of his freshman year at college died of complications during a kidney transplant. He decided to donate a kidney to a seven-year-old girl he babysat during high school. He heard around town what she was going through and decided he needed to help. He went to the parents' house to give his thoughts and find any way to help. After being told 
that there was too long a waiting list for them to get the surgery before her kidneys failed completely on her, Garrett decided he needed to help. Garrett went immediately to the hospital to get an examination and was told he was fit to donate. Everyone told him he was too young and that there must be another way, but he knew that there wasn't. Garrett died saving a little girl that he owed nothing. Because he knew that she deserved to have a life, he didn't know going into surgery if something bad would happen, but he knew there was a risk and he was willing to take it. His death was soon after the operation. Michael was called by the hospital and drove as fast as he could to see his brother during his final minutes. When he got to the room, the nurse told him that the final thing his brother said was that he was happy to have given life, no matter what the cost. As Michael was significantly older and already lost his compassion and kindness, he was destroyed inside. The only glimmer of hope he had to retain his old self for something beautiful to be around in the shadows was now gone. His main thought was, why him? Why could someone so sweet and innocent die, but someone who gets paychecks firing bullets at people live? He couldn't even cry at the funeral. To him, Garrett was the redeemable quality Michael always dreamt of retaining. And with the end of Garrett came the end of all hope. He was cold and bitter before, but after that moment he became a shell of a human being, acquiring perhaps the most damaging quality someone could have, lack of empathy. Lack of empathy in everyone, everything, and even himself. With complete callous in life, he did what he was supposed to do and didn't care whether or not anyone was hurt. He didn't care what he did, he just did what he was told. This was the last thought fleeting through his mind as he flipped the case open and put his index finger on the button, but there was still hope. He imagined a world where Garrett still lived and everything was okay. Michael was happy again. Life was good. And the meaningless fight between two different societies never occurred. And the bomb to end that meaningless fight didn't murder millions of people. The thought was gone as the muscles in his hands pushed his finger down and the red bulb above it lit like a firework. The sirens blared and the missile could be heard launching off of its pad. Michael went back to his desk, sat down, and put his head in his arms. The phone rang but he didn't answer. Instead, he fumbled around in the top desk drawer. He didn't know why, but he realized it as soon as he felt the steel of his handgun touch his palm. God save us all, but me. He pulled out his handgun and closed the desk drawer. I'm not sure what I expected dying to be like, but it wasn't like this never-ending torture that I am currently enduring. This is my story. On March 26, 2016, I was in the hospital, dying of lung cancer. Yeah, it sucked. I got all the chemo drugs, and they made me sick to my stomach. I was on oxygen for the last two years of my life, and the cancer was slowly robbing me of my ability to breathe. I got short of breath even walking across the room. So I thought it finally came time for me to breathe my last, it would be a massive relief. I was wrong. They pronounced me dead at 2.12am on March 27. My heart has ceased to beat and my lungs had ceased to breathe. I know that time and day because I heard them noting the time and date. 
I heard my son's tearful goodbye, and I felt him kiss my forehead. I heard my daughter-in-law struggling to find the right words to say, then finally leaving the room, saying nothing. My husband, I thought, would be waiting for me on the other side, but perhaps he is trapped in his own personal hell. I felt them transfer me to a cold, hard, steel gurney, and wheel my body down the hall. I wanted to scream, I'm not dead, but I couldn't do anything. My soul was trapped in my body that had ceased to function, but despite that, I was still capable of hearing, smelling, and feeling everything around me. Even though I could see nothing but the darkness that marked the back of my eyelids. I was picked up by the Mordekin, or at least somebody working for him. I was stuck in a hearse and then wheeled down the road. At that point, rigorous mortis had set in, and with my muscles incapable of any give, I felt every single bump on that road and every turn that the hearse took. Heavy metal blared over the loudspeakers of my final ride. Finally, after what seemed like forever at that time, the car stopped and the gurney was jerkily pulled out of the vehicle, and I was placed in a very cold container. A refrigerator may not seem all that cold, but imagine spending hours wearing nothing but a hospital gown without being able to do much as shiver. But that's not the worst part. The worst part of it was the burial process, and the little glimmer of hope that dies as pain burns throughout your body you see, up to this point, I had thought that perhaps this was some terrible mistake and that I was still alive. Perhaps I would somehow be discovered, or at the very least, die in the process to go to a peaceful existence in the afterlife. But they put that needle in you and drain your life essence as they fill you up with different sort of preservatives that reeks of form aldehyde. And you know that this is no mistake. You are truly dead, and you are doomed to this forever. The pain was terrifying. It felt like my entire body was on fire, and I dreaded the thought of spending all eternity in this state. It was far worse than childbirth. Even the pain of childbirth is tempered by what is to come, whereas the pain from this ghastly process accentuated the never-ending doom that I was condemned to. The viewing and the funeral ceremony was absolutely garbage. The preacher talking about how great I was, even though he never knew me, and talking about how I'm in a better place. Don't kid yourself. I'm not in a better place. I heard every word you spoke, and I wasn't a great person. I made mistakes. I cheated on my husband a couple times. I smacked my kids. There are times that I was emotionally abusive. Listening to all this talk about me, being in a better place just tore me apart. I'm sorry about your mother, but she's in a better place now. The Lord needed another angel. She's watching over us, smiling. Quit all your bullshit. But then, perhaps it's better that they don't know about the horror that is my death. Could people truly live out their mortal lives, realizing that they are truly immortal? But death is just being forever paralyzed in a slowly decaying shell? The rest is just, well, about what you'd expect from a corpse in a cemetery. Hearing the dirt being shoveled onto my coffin really made my fate sink in. That was the scariest sound I'd ever heard. Realizing that I was going to be forever trapped in an underground tomb while feeling everything that my body went through. It was silent for a while, just nothing. There was a time before the worms worked their way into my coffin, and before the wood splintered and cracked. It was painful as the bacteria slowly ate away my body, but the pain accelerated as the ground creatures joined in and crawled and slithered about my rotting body. My skin is falling off, my eyes have been eaten, and my belly is full of pus. My pain is absolutely beyond description. But the absolute worst thing is realizing that I will feel the searing pain that will result every time a maggot eats my skin, 
or mold invades my gut, or that my brain becomes worm fodder. Even when there is nothing left but bone, I will feel the pain as water slowly erodes my skeleton into nothingness. The pain is horrible. But knowing that it will never end is even worse. Death is not eternal, but eternal agony.